What's going on, guys, and welcome to episode 550 of Hashtag Ask GSM here today for Wednesday, June 12th, 2024. I'm Graham GSM Matthews. Hope you guys are doing well and having a great week so far. 550, man. Fuck, that's crazy. I know I mentioned it last week, but it feels like just yesterday we were doing 500 and 400 and 300 and so on. Um, I think the current plan, as it always is, is to do another live episode with 600 and 50 episodes from now. So we did 500 almost exactly a year ago. It does not feel like it was a year ago. Time flies. But we did 500 in late June last year. The audio quality sucked. I should have checked it ahead of time. That was my fault. But it was fun. It was Alexis and I doing uh, all the questions for 500 a year ago. So I think we'll do another live show with 600, which, if I'm not mistaken, with 52 weeks in a year, and if we don't miss an episode, which we never do, and I haven't in like a fucking decade... If we don't miss an episode and we continue to do it until next year, which why wouldn't I? Uh, Unless I'm fucking dead, I should be here next year as well. And that'll be in another 50 episodes, which I think puts us in late May. So we did it at the end of June last year and two weeks from now. So we're two weeks earlier because like I said, 50 episodes, 52 weeks, blah, blah, blah. That should put us at the end of May for episode 600, which I think might be May 28th. You can check my math on that. I think that's when the episode... Uh, 600th episode is going to be. And we'll probably do it live, so keep an eye and ear out for that. That's not for another year, but something to look forward to, I suppose, here on the channel. If you want to send in a question to the show for this episode, that episode, or any episode, you could do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. So just a uh, kind of a warning here. This is one of those weeks where I have not organized the questions yet. So I have all the questions in front of me from YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, all the usual stuff, obviously. Um, I have not organized them into a document. So if I skip one by accident, I apologize. If I, if you hear your name one place and then hear it again later on, that's why, because I haven't organized it yet. So again, I apologize in advance. But we get started here. Mike does it from YouTube. Their first question was, he asks, how do you think a stable with Carmella, Chelsea Green, and Ariana Grande... I must... <laughs> you misspelled Ariana Grace. So my first thought was to say Ariana Grande. It sounds exactly the fucking same, but it's Ariana Grace. You didn't write Ariana Grace. You actually wrote Aria, Ariana Grave. I don't know if that's Corey Graves' sister, but that's what you wrote. But I assume you mean not Ariana Grande or Ariana Grave. I assume you mean Ariana Grace. But you're asking, what do I think about a stable with Carmella, Ariana Grace, Chelsea Green on the main roster? What to get over as a heel group? I think they would do well. I really liked what I saw from Chelsea and Ariana when they briefly interacted in NXT a couple of weeks ago. I thought that was cool. Um, as like a Mean girl stable, I was going to say we haven't seen that before in WWE. I actually feel like we've seen it a lot between Lay Cool, the Nikki Bella-led group, Team Bella, or whatever the fuck it was called about a decade ago. But we also saw it recently in NXT even with Kiana James, Izzy Dame, and JC Jane. And then they had Jasmine Nixon there as well. And then uh, Kiana James got called up, so that was it for her in that group. And that group never really went anywhere. Dame's on her own now. JC Jane and Nick's are doing their own thing. So we never really got that group fully fleshed out. Although I think the three women that you mentioned with their characters, I think would work really well together. Because we've seen Green and Chelsea, albeit briefly together on Raw in early 2023 before uh, Carmella got pregnant. I thought they were a great team. I thought, actually, Carmella was Chelsea's best partner. Piper Niven's great. I like Sonya Deville. I think uh, Piper Niven is who Chelsea Green has had chemistry with the least, although they've turned into a really good team. I think the Carmella-Chelsea pairing was just perfect. And then Carmella got pregnant, Sonya got hurt, and now she's on to Piper as Chelsea Green. Um, and then you throw Grace in there as well, who Chelsea, like I mentioned earlier, had interactions with in NXT not too long ago. And I think they worked uh, very well together. So I think putting them kind of together as well would be cool. Um, that would work well, I suppose. I don't really know if we need to see it, because we kind of already have damage control. You can have multiple female groups, obviously, uh, but with a, I don't want to say shallow women's division, because they have a lot of women on both brands. It would have to go on SmackDown. Carmella's not assigned to a brand. Grace is in NXT. She's not really main roster ready right now. Um, I wouldn't necessarily do it, but maybe at some point down the road it could work, and I wouldn't be opposed to it, because I feel like all three of those women could have really good chemistry together. 
His next question, will Drew McIntyre use his Broken Dreams entrance theme at Clash of the Castle this year or no? I don't think so. I feel like they kind of gave people what they wanted, although it wasn't exactly what we wanted, but it was their version of like, hey, here's what you want, although it's we're only going to do it limited and not the entire thing, and I think Drew wanted the entire entrance. Uh, at the last Clash of the Castle two years ago, they gave it in the, not even the video package, but rather the... Um, like the walkout kind of, it would be perfect because he's like supposed to be the heel and he's a heel now and he's also a baby face and people would pop for it because he's going to be the baby face in front of that crowd. They did it as like the intro for his entrance the last time. It would be cool if they gave it to him as the full on entrance this time when no one's, I don't want to say no one's expecting it, you're asking about it, but it's not as widespread of a movement as it was last time because people just wanted to hear the fucking song again on WWE TV and we did, um, but it wasn't, fully what we wanted, so it would be cool if they gave us the complete entrance. I don't think they will. I'm not expecting it, though. Emmanuel A., his first question was, he says, how well do you remember the Money in the Bank match at uh, WrestleMania 26, and do you think someone else could have, or rather should have won it? I believe it is still the only Money in the Bank match with more than eight competitors. Christian, Dolph, Drew, Evan Bourne, Jack Swagger, Kane, Kofi Kingston, Matt Hardy, MVP, Shelton Benjamin for 10. Uh, considering Vince's initiative towards pushing younger talent that year. Do you think Swagger was a fair choice at the time, or do you think that Ziggler, McIntyre, Bourne, Kingston, any of those four, would have been better? Alternatively, do you think it would have been better to just let one of the veterans have the WrestleMania moment, quote-unquote, that night, whether it be Benjamin, Christian, Hardy, Kane, or MVP? Um, That's a good question. I remember that match vividly, because that was the first WrestleMania I had watched live, I had been a wrestling fan since April of 08, so right after WrestleMania uh, 24. WrestleMania 25, I think I've told that story before, this story before, but I was actually grounded when that mania happened. So my friend invited me over to his house to watch the show with him, and I couldn't because I was grounded, so I didn't watch the show live that year. Um, I got it on DVD months later, I did watch it then. WrestleMania 26, this time I was not grounded, so he invited me over again, watched it with him that year and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. But yeah, I remember that match, and even thinking then, I remember even then not liking that match. It had way too many fucking people in there. I know they wanted to get as many people on the card as possible. They even had a fucking WrestleMania Battle Royal that year. They didn't televise it, but they had the Battle Royal that year as well on the pre-show, only for the live audience. They could have just put some of those people in that match. Like, some of those people, I guess everyone that you mentioned was doing stuff at the time. Bourne was still in the process of being pushed. McIntyre was being pushed. Kane, Hardy, Christian, they were all, like, you know, on-screen regulars on SmackDown and shit. So I get it. But, like, that match did not need 10 people. That is probably one of the weakest Money in the Bank ladder matches they have ever done. And it had some cool moments. But I think even 09 was better. 2011 was better. The 2011 ones, not at WrestleMania 20, uh in 2011, because they didn't have it at WrestleMania in 2011, at WrestleMania 27. But yeah, the match itself was a mess. Jack Swagger, it's, I think, edited now on Peacock. It was also edited on the DVD, I remember that as well. That when Jack Swagger took down the briefcase, it took him a literal, full-on, like, 30 fucking seconds. Because he couldn't get it unleashed. So, you won't notice that now, but if you were watching at the time, it took him a long fucking time. And it was a messy match. I didn't like the match. I didn't really like that Swagger one. I thought it was a cool moment. And then he, like we talked about last week, cashed in way too early. And the problem with Swagger winning was that he was a good person to have the briefcase. But here's the issue, though. He wasn't main roster, or not main roster, he wasn't main event ready at that point. And the other thing was, his booking prior to that point fucking sucked. He had really good booking, which I'll talk about later on because someone else actually asked about Jack Swagger. A lot of Jack Swagger interest here on this show in the last two weeks. Um, But he was pushed well early on in his WWE run, and then in 2009, he just became a mid-carder. And then even worse than that, if he's a mid-carder, okay, fine. A lot of mid-carders have won Money in the Bank. By late 2009, early 2010, the guy could not win a fucking match. Like, he even was losing to Santino Morella at that point. In early 2010, which who he went on to feud with actually a couple of years later, and he dropped the United States Championship to in early 2012. But by that point, Santino was far more over than Jack Swagger was. Um, it was one of those things where it was like, why? Like the timing felt weird. His subsequent reign as World Heavyweight Champion sucked. 
Swagger was not the right choice. He was easily one of the worst Money in the Bank winners they've ever had. One of the worst Money in the Bank ma- ladder matches, Money in the Bank ladder matches they've had, period, actually. So that whole thing was a disaster. As far as who I would have had win instead, that's a good question. You look at the people who were involved. Kofi was actually, I think, the plan to win until the Randy Orton thing happened. The whole, oh, stupid, 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 because he fucked up the spot in the match or whatever the hell it was. I think that, honestly, that moment alone, like, we kind of exaggerate, like, oh, it was, you know, not we, like, we definitely do, but I could see some people thinking, oh, that wasn't exactly what killed Kofi's push. No, it definitely fucking did, because as soon as that Orton match was over, that Orton feud was over, they literally did not push Kofi again for a long time. Like, I think he was Intercontinental Champion that spring, but he didn't win Money in the Bank, and that was the whole plan was to push him towards the main event scene coming out of WrestleMania. He didn't even qualify until, like, the week before the fucking pay-per-view. So, he was in the match, barely. Um, I think he would have been a, been a better person to win it, Kofi Kingston. Drew, they were pushing him towards that point. Drew was not ready for the main event in 2010. He was another one where I know creative writers who worked there at the time have since confirmed that Drew was who was supposed to win the briefcase at the Money in the Bank pay-per-view in 2010. Not at Mania necessarily, I don't think. Maybe it was the plan at one point. But I think he was supposed to win the briefcase at Money in the Bank 2010. And he didn't. Kane did. Could you have Kane win here? Kane went on to win later that year anyway, so no. MVP, maybe. They didn't really push MVP as anyone special in 2010. He actually ended up leaving the company later that year. So probably not MVP. Christian would have been cool. Christian was actually on his way to SmackDown anyway. So honestly, I probably would have had Christian win it or Kofi. Benjamin was never, like, it would have been cool for him to win it at least once because he was in so many Money in the Bank ladder matches, but he was never going to win the World Championship, and if he did, it would have just not made sense because he was not a main event guy. Like Jack Swagger, and even Jack Swagger was probably more of a main event guy than Benjamin was, even though Benjamin was better in the ring than Swagger was. But anyway... Uh, Bourne was not a main event guy. He should not have won Money in the Bank. And Ziggler, Ziggler was too early for. Ziggler would have been cool, but it was too early for him. He hadn't even won. Was he the Intercontinental Champion at that point? No, I don't think so. I don't think he won that title until later on in 2010. So he hadn't even had the mid-card title push yet. So Ziggler was too early for. McIntyre too early for. Kofi, maybe. I probably would have gone with Christian. Because Christian ended up getting drafted to SmackDown from Raw, right from ECW anyway, right prior to that point. So you would have had him on SmackDown, and SmackDown's main event scene in 2010 fucking sucked. I talked about that last week, but you had Swagger in there, Big Show. Kane had a career renaissance, and I enjoyed that. But, like, Kane and Taker feuding over the World Heavyweight Championship in 2010 was ass. You could have had them feud, maybe, and the feud I didn't even really mind at the time. But the matches were not great. And to hog the World Heavyweight Championship over that shit sucked. Like, the main event scene was so bad, they actually ended up moving Edge from Raw to SmackDown by the end of 2010. That's how bad it was. And Edge ended up winning the World Heavyweight Championship and holding it for a while. So I would have put Christian on SmackDown and had him cash in money in the bank, turn him heel, whatever, and do the whole World Heavyweight Championship thing you ended up doing with him in 2011. Just do it in 2010 instead. I think that would have worked out just as well. Would that have sacrificed the Christian and Orton feud? Sure, but that's another discussion for another time. You still could have done that. Uh, Christian maybe maybe could have been a World Heavyweight Champion in 2010 as a babyface and gotten the run that he probably should have had in 2011 for more than a month. Your second question, how do you feel about WWE speed and the knowledge that its first ever champion, Ricochet, is already leaving WWE? I don't think WWE speed is to blame for Ricochet leaving the company, first of all. I know that's not exactly what you're implying, um, it doesn't exactly send a great message, I would think. Andrade just beat Ricochet for the belt, I believe. He's now the current WWE Speed Champion. Listen, I really don't think the WWE Speed thing is that big of a deal. It's as simple as this. X slash Elon Musk paid WWE a lot of money to have an exclusive show on their platform. It's the same thing as Mixed Match Challenge, where it was exclusive. that was exclusive to Facebook. This one's exclusive to Twitter. This one's quicker. The Mixed Match Challenge thing, they tried to make more meaningful by adding stakes. And the first season was fun. It was just more content that wasn't necessary. They they ended up having to watch because it had mean. It had, like, fucking stakes. It was meaningful, quote-unquote. I think the winners got, like, the 30th spots in the Rumble during the second season. R-Truth and Carmella. WWE Speed, I do not watch. WWE Speed, the only... um, 
not knowledge, but like the only times I've watched it was when I was at SmackDown and they filmed the matches while we were there. Honestly, it's not a bad concept. Like the three minute thing, it probably should be five minutes. Three minutes is way too quick. It's not like an actual, I guess it is canon technically, WWE canon, but the matches are so short. I just don't even see the purpose in watching and reviewing it. Um, And I watch and review everything. I don't even really go out of my way to watch it. It just, no one really talks about it. No one really watches it. They don't really incorporate those storylines into WWE TV anyway. They acknowledge WWE speed, but they don't walk out there with the championship. It's not like an actively defended championship on WWE television. It is on speed, but that's about it. On on X, I guess. On Twitter. Um, the concept is fine. I think it's kind of cool. It's better than some of the stuff they've done in the past. I don't really see it lasting longer than a couple months, maybe a year. I feel like it'll probably die a death at some point. But yeah, I mean, it's it's different. I mean, a lot of people nowadays have such a short attention span that it kind of forces you to pay attention. I think three minutes is just way too quick. Five might be better. And then people, I saw people saying like, what if they did like longer matches, like seven minute matches? Well, at that point, it's not even, it's not WWE speed. At that point, it's a regular fucking dark match. So I honestly don't hate the concept. I just have no desire to go out of my way to watch it because it doesn't really matter. All the matches are kind of the same. Like they're all sprints, which I already get enough of in AEW anyway. Um, Next question, also from Micah, Um, going back to Micah. He says, looking back as it is now, was Cody losing at WrestleMania 39 the right outcome? Uh, We kind of answered this after WrestleMania 40. I'm still not confident in saying that it was the right outcome. Did it make the moment at 40 bigger? Yes. I hate to eat like eat my hat on this, but I have been adamant for a very long time that having Roman retain at WrestleMania 39 was the wrong call. I'm going to stick by that because it did a lot of damage to the SmackDown main event scene in the year that he was champion. All the bloodline bullshit that was great last summer, you could have done without the championship. You really could have. So everything that we're getting now, we could have gotten anyway, even if Roman wasn't champion. That match at 40 was amazing. You still could have done that stuff at last year's Mania. So I'm not going to say it was the right outcome in having Roman retain at WrestleMania 39. You could have made it work. So there really is no like definitive answer. I'm not going to say, oh yeah, having Roman win was amazing. I'm okay with it now in retrospect because the Cody match at 40... It didn't make it that much more predictable like I thought it would because there was a pretty decent chance Roman could still retain a WrestleMania 40. And it made the match better, especially with all the cameos and the way it was executed and shit. So I will say that. But I will not say if Roman had lost at 39, I'm not going to say that was the wrong outcome given what we got at 40. Because you could have had Cody as champion a year ago and it still would have been an amazing moment because that match at 39 was also really, really good. Jordan B. from Twitter, their question was, which current main roster stars do you feel need to go to NXT to reinvent themselves? For me, it would be Shinsuke Nakamura, Tamina, Tegan Knox, Giovanni Vinci, Cedric Alexander, and Ashanti the Adonis. The last time I checked, I'm pretty sure Tamina retired. Tamina has not wrestled in a very long time. I am not complaining. Tamina sucks. Tamina should absolutely not be in NXT. Um, the rest of those people, I would be perfectly fine with. Shinsuke, I love the idea for him to be in NXT. He got drafted to SmackDown, hasn't appeared a single fucking time. That was two months ago. Just put him in NXT. Um, Tegan Knox at this point, I, I don't want to say I want her in NXT because she really should be on the main roster. She spent enough time in NXT, but it's not like she's doing anything on Raw or SmackDown right now. She hasn't appeared on SmackDown since getting drafted. So at this point, fuck it, put her in NXT. That was the rumor. Vinci, that's the only way they're going to salvage his career. Even then, he might appear in NXT and still get fired, but he got booted from Imperium, and we have not seen that man since. He got drafted to SmackDown, didn't make a difference, hasn't shown up since. So, Vinci, I don't really like the whole Giovanni Vinci character he was doing two years ago, but it's better than not being on TV. And then Cedric and Ashanti, why the fuck not? I mean, Ashanti wasn't really in on NXT regular for that long, um, he was on 205 Live, but like Hit Row wasn't in NXT for that long before that got called up. And then Cedric never really had a run in NXT, interestingly enough. He was always on the main roster or on, or on 205 Live. Um, he never really had a run in NXT itself. So at this point, they have no plans for the guy. I'm honestly kind of shocked they haven't fired him yet. I'm glad they haven't. But just utilize those guys in NXT if they have no plans for them on the main roster. Uh, back to Micah, his uh, next question was, 
And I saw this post on social media that said that WWE is trying to erase that everything that Brock Lesnar has accomplished in the company. If that's true, what are the chances Tony Khan signs Brock to AEW? If Brock did go to AEW, who should be his first feud in all elite wrestling? Um, I don't know where you're getting that from, that WWE is trying to erase Brock Lesnar. Because the funny thing is that we all thought he was fired, that he wasn't coming back. They still acknowledge him and mention him by name on WWE television at least once a week at this point. They did at Mania, and they have almost every week since then. Um, in various contexts and stuff like that. Um, he's still on their roster page. Brock is not trying to be erased. I know they took him out of the video game and marketing and shit, but they obviously intend to bring him back at some point. And if he is under contract, he's still under contract. And if he's not, they are still going to bring him back. I, I was pretty confident they wouldn't in Wake of the Vince stuff, but I think it would be a bad look for the, if they brought him back anytime soon. They might try to bring him back after the Vince stuff dies down. The question is when that'll be. So, just to get that out of the way, I don't think they're trying to erase Brock. They still acknowledge him. I don't know if they've showed clips of him, but they have definitely mentioned him by name. I'll say that much. As far as um, him going to AEW, he's not going to AEW. Is there the chance that he could down the road? I suppose. I feel like if he was going to go to AEW, he would have gone there by now. Like, if Tony Khan had... I mean, I'm sure Tony Khan would take anyone, but depending on who it is. He has the budget for Brock. I mean, they could hire Brock for a lot of money. I'm sure he's not paying Mercedes Monet and Okada Peanuts. I'm sure he's paying them a lot of money. He could probably pay Brock what he would want to be paid. I would think. I would think. But AEW was at its peak in 2021. And that's when Brock probably would have come in. When they were back on the road. He was not under contract to WWE. I think he always wanted to come back after COVID. But if he wanted to try out something new, it probably would have been an AEW. Now, that being said, he has a real loyalty to Vince. Vince is gone. Could he now go to AEW? Yeah, I think that's it's possible. Is it likely? Not at all. I don't think Brock ever goes to AEW at this point. I feel like he likes the WWE schedule, um, even though WWE actually is more traveling than AEW. But, uh, you know, he's comfortable there. It's always been his home. He never went to TNA. I know we did the New Japan thing, as odd as that sounds, many years ago. But he never went to any other promotion. He came back home to WWE. He just has a built-in, you know, um, exposure there and experience and shit. Vince or no Vince. I mean, Vince was seemingly gone for a little while there in 2022 when he walked out and all that other shit. He came right back. I mean, Brock still worked for WWE at that point. So I don't think he's going anywhere. In an alternate universe, if Brock was in AEW, who would he work with? That's the tough thing. Like, who does Brock realistically work with in AEW when it makes sense? Even the Brock and Cody feud, to me, was kind of stretching it. But they made it work. Like, MJF and Brock, as talented as MJF is, Brock realistically would fucking kill him. I mean, that just doesn't even make sense. I know Ray is taking Brock to the limit, and that's wrestling for you. But even Ray is better than MJF as far as being, like, an underdog. MJF, I just don't buy that. Kenny Omega, maybe. Uh, Wardlow, at one point in time, maybe. Now he's a fucking bum, so that would be a joke. Uh, Powerhouse, maybe. Brian Cage would just get destroyed. Uh, Lance Archer would just get destroyed. I don't even really know. Like, Okada, maybe? Because he's a main event talent. He would be competitive with Brock. Maybe Okada? Uh, Jack Perry would be killed. Sammy Guevara. Darby Allen would be murdered. I mean, none of those people really make sense. That's why Brock and AEW just isn't a good fit. Because realistically, who does he even work with over there? Honestly, the, the best possible option I can think of is someone that he's already worked with before. But Samoa Joe, I mean, they had one five-minute match seven years ago, um, and that wasn't enough. I know they had the four-way the following month, but like as, as far as a singles match goes, he only worked once with them on pay-per-view, and it was a great match. For as short as it was, it was great. Samoa Joe's established in AEW. He's a bigger guy. They have the history from many years ago. He could revisit that, but beyond that, there's not a lot of opponents, honestly, for me, of uh, four Brock, potential opponents for Brock and AEW that really excite me, because a lot of them, to me, just wouldn't make sense. Chris W. from YouTube, he says, um, Hi, Grim. Hope you're doing great. Having a wonderful week and excited for Clash of the Castle this weekend as well as Father's Day. Uh, boy, does time fly by fast. He said, I thought for the most part Battleground was a forgettable show and one of the weaker PLEs NXT has ever put together. I enjoyed the women's title match despite the overbooking of the ending. The latter match was okay despite me kind of wanting Jada Parker to win. Jada Parker's not ready. I like Jada Parker, but she is absolutely not fucking ready. Uh, she's improved. But she's not ready. 
Anyway, he says, uh, and the other matches, especially the main event between Trick and Ethan Page, were all functional but forgettable. I feel they overhyped the pay-per-view by selling it as NXT at the Apex and they hot shot of the TNA star and a newly signed star to title shots without any real build, just for empty ratings grabs and nothing else. What were your overall feelings on Battleground? So we're going to be doing a full-on in-depth discussion on Battleground match-by-match analysis on WrestleRant Radio tomorrow. Uh, you know, spoiler alert on that. But as far as my overall thoughts, I thought it was a good show, not one of their better shows, one of their weaker shows. I don't know. A lot of the NXT PLEs during the uh, NXT 2.0 era, NXT Black and Gold, whatever the fuck you want to call it, since 2021, have all, a lot of them have really blended together. The only one that really stands out as being great was like the No Mercy show from last year. That was where Trick Williams became North American champion. And we got that great, two great matches with Becky and Tiffany, and then Ilya and Carmelo. And that's when Ilya became NXT champion, and Becky beat Tiffany in the main event in that Extreme Rules match. That's probably the best NXT PLA they've ever done during this era. And they've had some other good ones, but that was probably the best. The one we just got was pretty good. Um, No bad matches, six solid matches, mostly the right winners, I would say. Uh, I thought Jordan and Roxanne had a great match. The main event was fine, like you said. Um, was it overhyped? A little bit. I mean, that was the most excited I've been for an NXT PLE in a long time because of Ethan Page being on it and Jordan Grace being on it. But Jordan Grace and Roxanne, I would say, lived up to the hype. It wasn't a bad match. And I also wasn't expecting a barn burner from Trick and Ethan Page. I was just excited to see Ethan Page in a WWE ring for the first time. So I thought it was a good match. It wasn't a bad match. wasn't expecting a title change. So the show was pretty much what I thought it would be. Um, so I'm not really sure what more you were, were expecting. As far as like them hot shotting Ethan Page into a shot, yeah, the builds were rushed. But listen, it's better than the alternative of Trick Williams versus Noem fucking Dar, who they were teasing for like a month. So I would rather take Ethan Page on a on a whim then Noam Dar after a two-month build, because that had zero and in- sub-zero interest with me. I probably would not have even watched the show live if it was Noam Dar and Trick Williams in that main event. The Jordan Grace one, again, the build was pretty self-explanatory. There really was no more need, not much of a need to build it up more than they did. Uh, and the match was was great. The, the finish was tainted, but it was a really good match. So, I don't know. I enjoyed the show for what it was. His second question, he asks... This weekend, Ricochet has stated he's leaving WWE when his contract expires, and fans immediately believe that he will go to AEW. While I would love to see him go to AEW, I think he should hit other promotions like TNA, MLW, and especially New Japan. Uh, The list of opponents for him outside of WWE is absolutely wild when you think about it. Where would you like to see him go first? Who would you like to see him go up against first? And do you think this could affect Samantha Irvin's stance in WWE, tempting her to leave when her contract expires as well? Maybe. I mean, so here's the difference. Yeah, there's a lot of couples that work in other promotions. The biggest thing, though, the biggest thing I would say is this. That with um, the couples, some of those couples have had no choice. Like when Keith Lee got fired, him and Mia Yim both got fired around the same time. Keith Lee went right to AEW. I don't know if Mia Yim had that same opportunity. I don't know if they wanted her in AEW or what. She then got hired back to WWE. I'm sure she would love to work with her husband. Maybe someday they will. Malachi Black, same thing. They both got fired, her, him and Zelina Vega. They fired him, actually, at a time where she was already on her way back. So, it, I mean, he stayed. It's not like he left or was going to leave when she got fired. Zelina got, Vega got fired in late 2020, and then she got brought back the following summer. He was going to be there when she got there, and then he got fired, and she still came in anyway. So people are willing to work in other promotions, um, people have left for their significant other. That's not that it's not that it hasn't happened. It happened twice actually in the last ten years that I know of. Once when Moxley left. I mean CM Punk and AJ Lee is another example, but it kind of seemed like she did everything she wanted to do anyway. But the other two examples I was thinking of is one when Dean Ambrose left in early 2019. Renee Young still worked there even when he was in AEW, but she was different though than Samantha Irvin where. She had been with WWE for a long time, and they were clearly not phasing her out, but they didn't really have much more for her to do. She hit her peak when she did raw commentary. Not her peak performance, because I didn't think her commentary was very good. It was okay. Uh, she's always been better as an announcer, or as a backstage interviewer type shit, whatever, doing like the pre-show panels. 
they were clearly moving her backward. Like, they didn't give her any time for her own shows. Like, they had Talking Smack at that point. I think they had actually just brought it back after she left, and they gave it to Kayla Braxton. Um, But even that, they probably would have taken her off of that, too. So, it was clear that Renee Young had done it all that she wanted to do in WWE. Her husband didn't work there anymore. She obviously got pregnant soon after. Um, That one kind of made more sense. And then the same thing with Brandy Rhodes. When Cody Rhodes requested his release from WWE in 2016, she also left right after him when he, she was still eating styles in 2016. They might have called her Brandy, I don't remember. But she also requested her release. But again, she didn't really have any upward mobility in that company. She was in the same spot. She was a ring announcer. She was not Samantha Irvin. She was not great. She was not very good. And again, she was okay. But like... Again, I think part of the reason why she was even brought back was because she wanted to work with Cody again in late 2013, early 2014, and they brought her back. When Cody wasn't there anymore, she wasn't really happy there either, it seemed like, and she left too. So, Samantha Irvin, I would be very surprised if she wasn't happy there. Ricochet, I could see from a booking standpoint why you would want to leave. Samantha Irvin is like their go-to ring announcer, and she has been for a while now. They clearly really like Samantha. They kind of let her do what she wants as far as, like, the inflection in her voice during her ring announcements. I mean, she kind of did it with Chelsea Green. They told her to stop, and then then they let her do it again. So they clearly really like Samantha Irvin. Um, I don't know if I have ever seen a ring announcer in WWE get as most as much exposure and as much love from a company as WWE has to Samantha Irvin. I know, obviously, Howard Finkel was involved in some stuff, as was Lillian Garcia. They notoriously bullied those people. I don't want to say out the door, but, like, they would make fun of Finkel. They would make fun of Garcia. um, And they used her in some angles and gave her some screen time, but they notoriously made fun of her. They obviously really, really like Samantha. It's also a different regime. If it was Vince still in charge, maybe it would be different. But they clearly really like Samantha. She's amazing at what she does. She announced, I think, all the matches at WrestleMania. They didn't even have her split duties with the then-SmackDown ring announcer Mike Rome, who's now in NXT. I mean, she's a lot better than Alicia Taylor. I like Mike Rome a lot, but she's the person they've really put all their eggs in her basket for Samantha Irvin. Unless she's just not happy there and there's other shit going on behind the scenes that we don't know about, I don't think she's going anywhere. At least not anytime soon. We don't know when her contract is up. And, I mean, could she follow him to, like, an AEW or something? I guess, but I feel like AEW has their Justin Roberts and other people. Like, they kind of have their go-to ring announcers as well. I mean, I guess beyond Justin Roberts, the well runs dry because they fired Dasha Fuentes, who I didn't think was also very good. Even in WWE, I didn't think she was very good. Uh, Samantha's great, so I I don't think they would let her go or would want to let her go. And I don't know if she would want to go. I think she's perfectly content where she is. Unless she just can't bear to not be by Ricochet's side everywhere that he goes, I think they're perfectly fine going their separate ways as far as where they work for the time being. Again, maybe he's back in a couple years. Who knows? She's young enough to where she can be around for a very long time. So maybe she does leave at some point. Anytime soon, I would be surprised. As far as Ricochet goes, um, like, where does he go after WWE? I do think he will ultimately end up in AEW. I mean, how do we not get Ricochet and Osprey at some point? And I thought with Mercedes, like, oh, they could bring her in as a one-off. AEW doesn't really do that sort of stuff. Unless they work for New Japan. I mean, they've worked with people like that on Forbidden Door type shit. And I guess Mercedes also worked for New Japan. But even then, when she passed on WWE, she signed with AEW. So I think Ricochet... Could he bounce around? Yeah, but I think he's going to have to sign somewhere at some point. Um, I really do think he should end up in AEW. I feel like there's a lot of matches to be had there. He could bring a lot of depth to New Japan. New Japan has no fucking buzz right now. But, you know, and at that point he could still work with AEW if he ended up in New Japan. TNA is possible. TNA would be cool. Um, He would be a much higher top-tier talent in TNA than he would be in AEW. So there's pros and cons to everything. TNA is not really that big of a platform. Obviously, now they're working with WWE, but, you know, otherwise, they're really not that high up on the totem pole. Um, You mentioned MLW. Yeah, MLW for, like, a one-off or two would be cool. I'm not sure who we would work with, like Alex Kane. MLW's roster kind of feels depleted, too. Uh, But, like, Ricochet and Speedball would be fucking awesome. Osprey's going to happen at some point. Ricochet and Leo Rush. I don't think they had any matches together in WWE. I could be wrong. I might be wrong, I don't remember. But uh, I think they did, actually. I think Ricochet made his main roster debut, actually, 
facing Leo Rush in like a handicap match, didn't he? I don't know if they ever had a one-on-one match, but anyway. Um, yeah, if he ended up in all these other promotions, that would be cool. I do think he probably will go to AEW, and that's fine. Will he end up on Rampage or pulling TNT title duty at some point? Probably. Like, I don't see him being a main event guy. I, I just don't see Ricochet being a main event guy. In TNA, maybe, on a major scale, I don't. But in TNA, I think it'd be cool. I, I really don't care where he ends up. As long as he does something cool and is allowed to showcase his skills to the fullest ability. That's kind of where my head's at as far as Ricochet goes. Again, more of a discussion on that on WrestleRant Radio tomorrow as well. Cheap plug. Um, your next question. Who was on your Mount Rushmore of Ruthless Aggression Era women? For me, it's Trish Stratus, Lita, Stacey Keebler, and Tori Wilson. But I would also substitute any of them with Melina and Mickey James. Who would you pick as your top four? Um, you got Lita. You got Trish. I would get definitely Stacey Keebler out of there. I do not think of Stacey Keebler. I, I, when I think of ruthless aggression, I do not think of Stacey Keebler. <laughs> At least not maybe not ruthless aggression, but like the women's division. Stacey was eye candy. She was involved in a few angles. She was more so involved in like the late Attitude Era stuff in early 02, 03 than anything in like 05, 06. By that point, she was out the door. Tori Wilson was around for that pretty much that entire period. But beyond the Dawn Marie stuff, what did she do that was really all that memorable? You know, so I would take them out of there. I would say Lita, Trish, I would give you Mickey. Mickey makes sense. She debuted in oh, late 05, did the, you know, storyline with Trish. That was still ruthless aggression. 07, she was women's champion. I guess it kind of depends what you consider ruthless aggression. Where does it end? It starts in 02. When does it end? 05, 08, 06. I would still include Mickey, though. If it's like... 05 and beyond, I would include Mickey. Um, I was thinking Melina. Melina was really towards the end of Ruthless Aggression. I mean, she was in the ring on SmackDown in 05, 06. She wasn't really like a top-tier talent in the Raw Women's Division until like 07. So I would say take out Melina and put in Victoria. Victoria was there that whole time. She was a multi-time women's champion. She was actually very good by the standard of that women's division at that time. So I would say Victoria, Mickey James, Trish, and Lita. And your last question here. I just watched the video the other day about the EV 2.0 storyline back in 2010 in TNA. Looking back on it, I absolutely see how much of a half-hearted train wreck the entire thing really was. Um, for starters, it follows the trend during that putrid period over uh, of over-the-hill washed-up wrestlers taking up spots for men and women who were supposed to be the future of the company for a cheap, nostalgic pop. Another problem was that most... Uh, especially Tommy Dreamer had to work with against said younger guys, thus making them having to sell their weak offense. Uh, while it wasn't the worst thing TNA had done during the Hogan Bischoff era, it was one of their lazily, it was, it was one that was lazily threw together without any effort in trying to make it worth investing our emotions in. Why do you think the EV 2.0 storyline failed and did it make TNA look bad and desperate to keep their fan investment after the botched Monday Night Wars of 2010? That EV2 stuff was fucking terrible. You know how bad it was? In the 16 years I've been watching wrestling, I've been watching TNA for just as long. I started watching WWE in April of 08. I made that quite clear. It wasn't that much longer until I started watching TNA. Like August, September, I got into TNA. I watched every episode. I really don't remember a lot about it. But I followed TNA and watched it when I could from 08 to 09. I fell out of it in like 09... Um, because we had just moved and we didn't really have cable and I couldn't record any shows. So I kind of fell out of it in late 09. But when the EV2 stuff started, like I started watching it again in like the summer of 2010. I I just couldn't get into it. I just couldn't watch the product. It was just fucking awful. That ECW stuff, a lot of those guys were so washed up and they were just terrible. And why did it fail? I think the most prominent reason was they were trying something that WWE had done at least two or three different times prior. And it didn't really work then to like middling success, mixed results. And like, so like the Alliance happened and that was that they then brought back ECW for one night stand and it was great. But then when they tried it again in 06 with the brand itself, it just wasn't what they thought it would be. And then ECW died as a brand early on in 2010 TNA, all of a sudden thinks it's so great to then revamp ECW again, not as a brand, but for like that hardcore justice show and they kept those guys around. The Hardcore Justice show wasn't even that good. I remember watching parts of it, and it fucking sucked. Like, you look at the card, a lot of these guys have no reason being in the ring at that point. TNA already had some of those people on their roster. 
So that's why they decided to do another ECW reunion. But by 2010, a lot of those guys were washed. Some of them were dead. I mean, it just wasn't worth it. In 05, it worked. Five years later, it was a big difference. It sucked. Um, they kept a lot of those guys around for a few months to do the whole... They wanted to use them to put over the Fortune guys. And the thing was, they lost every fucking match they had. EV2, whatever you want to call it, um, Extreme ECW version 2, they lost almost every single match they had. Which they should have, I guess. But, like, if they never really win, then what credibility do the heels really get in beating these guys? The answer is none. So, the matches weren't good. The storyline sucked. I really couldn't get into it. Um, I had no interest at all. So, moreover than anything, like you said, a lot of those guys couldn't really work in 2010. The storyline had been done before. It was a retread of an angle that didn't really work the first time. And it just wasn't good. So, that's why it failed. Now we move on over to the Facebook questions here. We will start with No L. They say, uh, if you could do one Money in the Bank winner in the last 10 years over, who would it be? That's a great question. In the last 10 years, so are you saying, like, pick a different winner? Or, like, if it's the same winner, would they just be booked differently? I'm going to assume you meant the former and just, like, change the winner. So, like, I guess we already talked about this with the 2010 win. That's not in the last decade, though. In the last 10 years, we'll go through it quickly here. 2014, Rollins, perfect. Uh, 2015 was Sheamus. I like Sheamus winning. The run itself sucked, but, like, Sheamus winning, I didn't really mind. 2016, Ambrose, perfect. 2017 was Corbin. I liked Corbin winning. The cash-in was awful. Carmella winning was, was fine. She was the perfect winner that year. Uh, 2018, Strowman, I was fine with. Um, but then he ended up losing, which sucked. Alexa Bliss was fine. 2019, Bailey worked. I mean, I would I would not have put the briefcase on Brock. I guess 2019 would be my answer. Or Otis, actually. Otis winning was just fucking stupid. So either Otis... The women's ones have been fine. So probably Otis or Brock. And then what, are the, what were the other ones? 2021 was Big E. Nikki Cross. Ugh, who cares? Um, the Big E one was great. 2022 was Theory, which I liked. Again, the run itself sucked. And that was Liv Morgan, who had a good, you know, a great cash in, I thought. And then last year was who? Who won it last year? A Damian Priest, obviously, and the Sky, which were, which were good. So, yeah, I would probably change between Brock and Otis. They were both, like, Brock had no business winning the briefcase. But you know what, honestly? Brock at least had Boombox Brock. That little phase there, Otis's money in the bank had nothing. That whole thing was a ginormous waste of time. So I would change Otis. And I would say give the briefcase the styles. He was in that match. Aleister Black was also in there. You could have given it to Black. Black was clearly checked out at that point. Um, even then. I mean, they just they were doing nothing with him on the main roster around then. So maybe Aleister Black. You know, and maybe AJ would have made sense because he had lost a lot and... You know, him cashing in and becoming world champion, maybe on the SmackDown side would have been cool. But I think he was on SmackDown at that point anyway. Um, or was he on Raw? I think he was on Raw at that point. So he could have cashed in on Drew. Mm, let's say Aleister Black. I would have had Aleister Black win in 2020 instead of Otis. That was just an absolute waste. Um, your second question. Also, do you think John Cena made the right call by not letting Jack Swagger cash in on... A lot of Jack Swagger questions, I told you. Um, do you think John Cena made the right call by not letting Jack Swagger cash in on him, given that John Cena was in a rivalry with Batista at the time and also John's promo on Swagger after becoming world champion, saying that you aren't champion material? I don't remember that. Did Cena make the right call? Um, yeah. I mean, Swagger, he was not world champion material at that point. After the booking, the bad booking he endured, I, I mentioned this last week, he should not have been world champion at that time. So he should not have cashed in as quickly as he did. If he were to cash in on Cena a couple of months later, then maybe. But if they were so adamant about having Swagger cash in immediately, then him going to SmackDown was the better bet. And even then, they failed him. Even on SmackDown, they failed him. He was never the face of the show. He had a terrible run. He was never in the main events again after losing the World Heavyweight Championship. It was right back down to the lower mid card. The guy was a loser. Um, it was a complete waste of time. So Cena, I guess, yeah, he did make the right call. Because like you said, he was feuding with Batista at the time. Their matches were over the WWE Championship. They didn't really need to be. But, 
I, I don't know, if he lost the Jack Swagger and, and dropped the WWE title to him, Raw would have been even worse. I mean, it would have had the same problem that SmackDown did. So you know what? Cena did make the right call by not wanting to lose to Jack Swagger because he just wasn't ready. Maybe if it had been built up better, maybe Cena was on to something. We say Cena buried people. He obviously did at certain points, which we'll get to in a second with the Nexus thing that uh, Chris asked about. But uh, you know what? Cena probably recognized this guy's not main event material right now, at least not right now. Uh, he had a very competitive match with Swagger at the draft the year earlier, but in 2010, Swagger had no buzz. He had no buildup. He had no credibility. He had no nothing. So Cena losing to this guy would have made him look like a loser. At least Jericho losing to him, he was a heel. It made more sense. Uh, Swagger didn't turn babyface, but Jericho had the whole, like, he was a heel. He was a smarmy heel. Edge and Jericho continue their feud. Not over the World Heavyweight Championship. It made more sense that way. Christopher L. from Facebook, their first question was, talking about the Nexus, uh, why was the Nexus so popular, or why are there so many people still bummed that the Nexus weren't pushed harder than they did? I got the concept of the group, but the truth is, only Wade Barrett was the only one with charisma and star potential, while the others were just incredible athletes and nothing more. <laughs> not everyone was an incredible athlete, I'll tell you that much. Michael Tarver I liked, he was not a great athlete. Neither was Ryback, but anyway. He says, in a way, they are uh, too familiar to the NXT guys of today. Why are people so high on the original Nexus when only one guy was the real star of the group? I mean, Daniel Bryan was a part of it, then he got fired, so he wasn't really a part of Nexus. Uh, Because the group itself was cool, man. They had buzz. It wasn't really about the individual athletes. Like It wasn't about, oh, Heath Slater, man, he's a main eventer. No, I mean, a lot of those guys weren't ready for that spot. But the group itself had potential. WWE had not done something like NWO-esque like that in a very long time. Like, they've had groups before, but nothing like that where they attacked everyone. It was unpredictable from week to week. It affected the entire show and not just segments of the show. The, The entire Raw roster was on notice. They took out Bret Hart. They took out Cena. They took out Punk. They took out everybody. In their debut. They took out the fucking ring announcer, which is what got Daniel Bryan fired, because of how he did it. But you know what I mean? Like, it was cool. It had buzz, it had momentum, it made people continue tuning in. And instead of following up on that, and making Wade Barrett a world champion, which he definitely could and should have been at that point, they failed to follow up. They had them fucking lose. And even when Wade Barrett beat Cena, they still didn't put the WWE title on the guy. I like The Miz, but they put the belt on The Miz before Wade Barrett. Wade Barrett would would have been a better, to me, better fit for that spot than The Miz at that point. And The Miz was a fine world champion, but Wade Barrett was more ready, even though he wasn't around for as long, because he had more buzz. He had the look, he could talk, he was a decent worker. I don't know, I just think, yeah, the group itself, if you really break it down, they weren't that main event talent. But they were all supporting characters for Wade. They were not going to get all o- these guys all over as future world champions. Justin Gabriel, they could have made more of a star than they did. He was a great athlete. The people could have really gotten behind him as a babyface. But they never really went in that direction. Uh, Slater was never really going to be more than what he was. Ryback got hurt. Um, Tarver wasn't very good. Otonga sucked. But the overall group was good. Um, and they had buzz, and it was something different. It was something different that 2010 WWE desperately needed. Fresh faces, fresh angle, something we had not seen in a long time, and they fucking ruined it. So that's why people still talk about the group and why they still have buzz. And you know what? Because the theme song was fucking awesome. That too. And we never heard that song again after 2011, which was a bummer because that song was a banger. His next question was, John Cena's 2012 was so heavily criticized for its lousy booking and unnecessary victories, including the Money in the Bank victory and the victory over Brock Lesnar and his return match in Chicago at Extreme Rules. Not to mention the utterly ridiculous action of constantly putting his matches over CM Punk, who was world champion at the time, especially the abomination known as the -the over-the-limit match with John Laurinaitis. Say you were uh, given the booking pen. How would you book John Cena's 2012? Easy. He would have lost every high-profile match that he had. Coming out of that Rock match at Mania, having him beat Brock was fucking stupid. I mean, it didn't ruin Brock, because obviously Brock ended the streak, ended up reclaiming some of that aura. But for a long time, he didn't have that aura, because for a long time, um, you know, he was just a guy that was there kind of suffering from 50-50 booking. 
because he lost his first match back, which was stupid. That match was amazing. Having Cena win that match still made no sense. And then Cena went on the mic and was like, oh, I'm going away for a while, completely no-selling the injury that he was selling the entire match from Brock. It made no- That whole thing was a disaster. I mean, Brock ended up recovering by attacking Triple H the next night, but it was stupid. Cena did not benefit at all. He beat Brock just to lose to John Laurinaitis. What the fuck? He was feuding with Big Show like anyone gave a shit. Like, that whole shit was terrible. But having him feud with Punk again, and he never won the title back from Punk, I liked that. That was well done. But, like, the Money in the Bank thing was a waste. But you gotta remember, the Money in the Bank that year, that match was WWE champions only. That was how they promoted the match. They wanted only WWE former former WWE champions in that match. Which is why Big Show was in it, which was terrible. Kane was in it. Okay. Cena, okay. And Jericho. Jericho probably should have won. But Jericho was on his way out, so they weren't going to do that. The Cena thing, they wanted to have him cash in and lose because it was unpredictable. It was a waste of the briefcase, but whatever. It led to that big match with Punk um, at Raw 1000, which made sense. The DQ finish was awful. Punk should have just beaten him straight up, but whatever. But, um, yeah. So, his 2012, I would have done some different feuds, have him lose to Brock, first of all, not even done the John Laurinaitis bullshit, I don't know what the roster looked like at that point, I don't really remember, but you could have had him feud with any number of people in mid-2012 that were better than that nonsense, I mean, there were other people, I mean, they didn't even really have a brand split in 2012, so you could have had him feud with Dolph Ziggler, who he feuded with anyway later that year and he lost to, thankfully, But, like, Cena won way more matches than he should have. I mean, he ended up losing a lot in late 2012, which was nice. I would not have had him win the Rumble. Like, they try to tell the story when he faced Rock again, oh, I've had such a tough year, which I guess he kind of did. But, like, when he was in there beating Brock, facing John Laurinaitis, beating Big Show, that whole stretch of the spring was terrible. Terrible television. Absolutely awful. And shit I would not want to relive for the life of me. It was just awful. Um, I would rebook that whole thing. The Punk stuff made sense. Having a main event over Punk as world champion sucked. That also made no sense. That was silly. Um, yeah, there was more they could have done with Cena in 2012, and that was more along the lines of what I would have done personally. His next question. You mentioned last week that you have a lot to say about how badly WWE botched Jack Swagger. I'm actually quite interested in what you have to say. Do you think there were issues with Swagger? Uh, why could WWE never quite figure out the right thing to do with him? Why did they overpush him too fast? Too soon to the heavyweight championship? And what lessons could be learned from the Jack Swagger experiment? I mean, I could do a whole video on this. I won't because we're already really deep into the video here. But here's my thoughts on Jack Swagger. I was really high on him in late 2008. I thought he was actually really good on the ECW brand. He had a good run as ECW champion. He was working with the veterans. He was beating those people like Dreamer, Christian, people like that. Finley, he was having some quality matches. He gets brought over to Raw, which I was looking forward to. And he didn't really do... The thing is, is that Swagger never really had a solid mid-card run. In the second half of 09, early 2010, he lost a lot of matches. And whatever buzz he had in ECW... In ECW, he was a big fish in a small pond... On Raw, he was being overshadowed by DX, Legacy, Cena, Batista, like everyone that was on Raw around that point. And he never really was able to get over that. Jericho, you know, people like that. So, um, that didn't really do him any favors. He definitely should have won the United States Championship before winning the World Heavyweight Championship. He should not have won Money in the Bank when he did. And if he was going to, and even then, I would have had him win, I would have had him win the United States Championship first, he should not have won the Money in the Bank briefcase. But like Emmanuel mentioned last week and, and this week, WWE was in panic mode, like, oh, we got to build new stars because Taker was taking time off after Mania. He was not a full-timer anymore, really. Triple H was taking time off. Shawn Michaels retired. Jericho was leaving. No, he was still there at that point, but he was leaving later on in 2010. Um, Batista was retiring. He was done. So they were losing a lot of stars at one time. Edge retired the following year. They were losing a lot of their top talent around the same time. So they needed new young stars. And they pushed really quickly people like Sheamus and Wade and Jack. Jack Swagger was not ready. Sheamus was more ready than Jack Swagger was. His booking just sucked. Jack Swagger, I don't think, was ever going to be a world champion. And if he was, he needed to be booked better than he was. 
that's the thing. Jack Swagger, even like the following year, it was pretty clear this guy is not world champion material. And they never really pushed him at that level again because he's just not WWE champion. He just doesn't have the charisma for that, the mic skills. Jack Swagger has always been a very good mid-card guy. Always. In AEW recently, they have way too many mid-carders, so he obviously got lost in the shuffle and no one gave a fuck about the guy. But in WWE 10 years ago, he was a good mid-carder. So I think they could have booked him differently by not pushing him, first of all, towards the main event as quickly as they did, if at all. But if they were going to, take their time with him and not rush him into that spot. That's one. The booking was partially to blame. Two, he was never going to be a long-term main event guy because he really couldn't thrive at that level as a talker. In the ring, he was very good, but as a talker, he wasn't great, and he didn't really have the charisma for that role. Miz had more charisma. Sheamus had more charisma. He eventually came into that ro- into his own in that role, did Sheamus. Swagger never really did. Uh, and the other part where I would say they really dropped the ball on Swagger was in turning a babyface in 2014. Again, he had momentum at that point. They turned him babyface for that whole We the People thing with uh, Rusev. And he was over. I was at the show where they turned him babyface, and people were really into Swagger that summer. And then he lost to Rusev, and that was it. <laughs> they never pushed him again after that. The Real Americans thing had uh, some potential, and they never won the tag title. So, again, anytime the guys had some buzz, they never really capitalized it on it properly. And any times they did push him, he had no buzz. Like, he, fu- like he finally won the United States Championship in early 2012, but it, it was at a point where no one gave a fuck about the guy any point, at, at, anymore at that point. He had no buzz. No one gave a shit about him. And it was like right back down to the mid-card. He lost the belt within two months to Santino, and that was it. And he never got that belt back because they just, people gave up on him. And he had no buzz. So, those are my uh, um, expediated thoughts, my uh, abbreviated thoughts on Jack Swagger and WWE and just in general. His last question here, which of these two do you feel had the better legacy in pro wrestling, Brock Lesnar or Kurt Angle? Both had my favorite rivalry of 2003 with two fantastic pay-per-view matches. Both are very successful amateur amateur wrestlers and both separately were the faces of SmackDown through the ruthless aggression era. At the end of the day, who would you say left a stronger legacy in the field of professional wrestling? I got to go, Kurt. I mean, I feel like that's a great question. You could say Brock, but I feel like, you know, how people of a certain generation were like, oh, Shawn Michaels and Brett got me into wrestling. I feel like people have said that and will say that about Kurt Angle. I mean, the matches he was having in the early 2000s, even into TNA, were fucking unbelievable. Multi-time world champion. Brock left WWE way too quickly. And then he came back, and he's had a very good run in the last 10 years, but he's been more of a part-timer. Kurt was a full-time guy having match-of-the-year candidates with a number of opponents from 2000 to 2006. And again in TNA when he went there later that year. Like, his own medical health problems got in the way, obviously. But overall, the guy had an amazing run. And he also won, like you mentioned, if you're going to go beyond wrestling and mention, like, oh, they had great amateur wrestling backgrounds and shit. Yeah, but guess what? Kurt won a gold fucking medal. So, I mean, that alone trumps anything Brock has ever done. And Brock is very accomplished in amateur wrestling, in UFC, in WWE. Kurt Angle's one gold medal trumps all of that. So I got to go Kurt Angle. Not only for that reason, but everything else that I mentioned as well. Now we get into the Twitter questions. Like I said, they are not organized on my end, so I apologize that they're going to be all over the place as they have been so far. Um, at Reborn Again, John Ritland from the Twitter machine and on YouTube, Real Honesty with John Ritland. Check out his content. He does great work. His first question was, so the Forbidden Door card is taking shape. One match that got added recently was Zack Sabre Jr. versus Orange Cassidy. I have a question. Was this the best they could find for Zack Sabre Jr.? Was it the best they could do? Probably not. Um, I'm fine with the match. I know you're not a fan, uh, John, and that's totally fine. I'm fine with it because there's a story there that they're telling. It's not just a random match. It is, but it's not. Because at last year's Forbidden Door, Orange Cassidy defended the International Championship and won. And Zack Sabre Jr. was like, I don't know if he pinned him, I don't remember. But he was like, listen, we got unfinished business here, blah, blah, blah. I think their two styles could end up working out really well. That was a fun four-way last year, and Cassidy was... It was the definition of a random... Like, you could ask the same question, and I'm sure you did or someone else did two years ago, when he faced Will Ospreay at Forbidden Door. That was, to me, a waste of Will Ospreay. But they ended up going in there and having the best match in the entire show. And that's still a match that I remember fondly two years later. So, um, Cassidy's great. Zack Sabre Jr. is also really, really good. 
I think it'll be a great match. I can't really complain. I don't know who else you would put him in the ring with. AEW has a lot of talent, so there's obviously a wealth of options. I mean, there wasn't one match beyond the Brian Danielson one, which, which we ended up getting at Wrestle Dream last year, um, that I would say, oh, like this match makes sense for Zack Sabre Jr. I'm sure there is, like a Daniel Garcia, but I don't know. I, I would have liked to have seen that more, sure, but I have enough faith in Orange Cassidy then the match will be good. So I don't really mind personally. So could they have done better? Yeah. But it's not like Orange Cassidy's a loser on the show. Like, he doesn't have a lot going on right now beyond the Trent feud. But Orange Cassidy's over. He's one of their top featured performers. So to me, it makes sense. And they have this story from last year. Uh, John's second question. Seems like next week's Raw will feature the debut of this Wyatt-inspired group. How do you think they'll be received? Um, so I've mentioned this a lot. I won't go into great detail as far as, like, whether I think it'll sink or swim. You're asking how I think it'll be received. I honestly, I hate to say this, I don't think it'll be received well by the live crowd. Online, it might go over well. I could see people saying, oh, that sucked. It fell flat. They built it up for two and a half months and it fell flat. I could totally see that. And we'll see if that's true or not. What I fear, though, is that the Toledo, Ohio crowd that they were in front of on Monday was fucking awful. I fear that we might get a similar crowd in Corpus Christi next week. Corpus Christi is notoriously a terrible crowd. I am very worried that debuting that group in front of that crowd will go over as well as the Wyatt family debut did, which was sick, but that crowd sat on their hands. They chanted for Husky Harris. That crowd sucked. Same thing when Evolution reunited in early 2014. Great moment. Crowd didn't fucking react. They were in Alabama or some shit. Like, what the fuck are we doing here? That shit was awful. Um, I kind of fear like it might be a similar reaction, or lack thereof, which is really disappointing. I hope I'm wrong, though. At Iwagu91, do you see Brian Danielson winning the Owen Hart Cup tournament this year in the AEW World title? I don't. I feel like if he was going to win the World Championship, he would have done so by now. I really think they should put the belt on Osprey on that show. Could they do that? Yes, they could. But the thing is, he's done full-time after that. So does he hold the belt for two months and lose it in Washington at Wrestle Dream? Yeah, I guess, but... I just feel like that's too similar to Sting. Like, Sting won a championship in his last match, and they went off on top. I think Danielson should have... I mean, not, not to say he should lose, but I don't really need... Like, it would be cool, but even though he's not full-time, he can always win the championship down the road. Like, even for a one-off, if he's a part-timer. Like, they could always go back to that. He's not done-done like Sting was done-done, you know? Done-done-done. But anyway, um, I would much rather see Danielson face Nigel McGuinness. I know it's a match that Nigel wants. I would imagine Danielson wants it. It's a match I think they were going to do last year. And then Danielson couldn't be on the show because he was injured at the time. I think they're going to do that match. And I think they should. I think it's a great send-off for Nigel. I think it'd be a great send-off for Brian. That's assuming Brian doesn't wrestle until Wrestle Dream, which he very well might. He hasn't really made that clear yet. I think his contract expires before All In. So he would have to sign like a two or three-month extension to be at Wrestle Dream too. But if they're going to be in Washington, then he probably should be on that show. But um, I think it's in Washington. I could be wrong. Maybe it was last year they were in Washington. I don't fucking remember. But yeah, maybe it's in Washington again. Who knows? But uh, yeah, I, I think it should be Brian and Nigel at all in. If they want to have him win the Owen Hart Cup, fine. But I think they could have Osprey win it and face Swerve again to that pay-per-view and win it and save Danielson for something else. Get two big matches. At, get two big matches out of it instead of just one. That's the way I see it. Uh, back to John here. He said, non-wrestling related. So Inside Out 2 comes out this weekend. If you saw the first one, what were your thoughts? And will you be watching the sequel at any point? Um, so yes, I will be seeing the second one. I have not seen all of the first one. I saw bits and pieces when they came out with it 10 years ago because I worked in a movie theater. So I saw a lot of it going in and out and shit. I have not seen, no pun intended. I have not seen the entire thing from start to finish. And my plan has been, and still is, to watch it um, probably tomorrow at some point before we see the movie either on Friday. The, the weekend is busy. So I'll probably watch the second one likely early next week. So yes, I have not seen the first one in full. I plan on watching it in the next few days. And then I will be seeing the second one at some point within the next week. So we'll see, uh, we'll see how it is. At Iwagu91, back to them, he says, with Ricochet written out of the WWE, what do you make of his time in WWE? Um, I won't go into great depth, because like I said, we talked about this in depth on WrestleRant Radio this week, or we will tomorrow, so check it out. But I think he, overall, honestly, I hate this bullshit that he, oh, they failed him. Ricochet was only ever going to get beyond a certain level. 
Could they have booked Ricochet better? Yes. They wasted a few years of his career there in like 2020, 2021, early 2022, when he wasn't doing shit. And that was an absolute waste of Ricochet. Absolutely. But like, he was still a champion a couple different times. He was showcased in the Triple H era more than he ever was before. He had a great run in NXT. I'm sure made a lot of money. Had a good run, was over. People like Ricochet, had a lot of fun matches. I can't say it was a failure. I mean, it's not like the guy was underutilized the entire time. They could have done more with him, but he was never going to be a world champion, I don't think, now knowing what his mic skill level is. It's not bad. I mean, he can cut promos, but and he's improved, but he's just not the level of a talker that other people are. He's got charisma, like he's great. He could have been a bit higher up on the totem pole than he was when they had him losing to literally everyone in 2020 and 2021. That was terrible. But overall, I would say he had a pretty good run. And if he leaves and becomes a bigger name, then maybe he comes back a bigger star. We'll see. Especially now that Triple H is in charge. I'm sure they would treat him like a bigger star. As opposed to uh, when Vince was in charge, they would probably put him right back in main event or some shit. At Iwagu91 still, um, he asked, what are your thoughts on Wendy Chu? I like Wendy. I think she's a good worker. The character stuff I think sucks. I hate the whole sleeping gimmick shit. Turning her heel is interesting. It just feels like we're back in Tion Shaw territory from a few years ago. Um, yeah. I just I just don't like the whole sleeping thing. I just think it's stupid. This is more bearable, but it's still not great. Let's put it that way. At noob underscore n underscore co TV, their first question was, what are your thoughts on Ricochet being written off of WWE? I believe that Braun Breaker writing him off is a good idea, but then I saw the thumbs up means that he's it's not over between him and Braun. No, not necessarily. I mean, it's not like he said that, hey, it's not like he flipped them off. I mean, he gave the thumbs up as far as, like, I'm okay. So, that doesn't mean that he's staying. I don't think he is. I think he is indeed done. Could he still resign? Yeah, but I think they're confident enough that he's done that they did what they did on Monday. But I thought the angle was great. That spot was sick. I thought it was well executed. You put over Braun on the way out. Well done. Um, Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So, I thought it was a great angle. Thought it was a great way to write off Ricochet. And uh, CNAW, I guess. Their next question, your thoughts on Roxanne Perez versus Jordan Grace from Battleground. I get the feeling that this partnership between TNA and NXT is becoming more and more interesting in the coming months. I hope so. I think so far, so good. They teased wrestlers from, quote-unquote, other locker rooms being in the Battle Royal, the number one contender's Battle Royal, for the NXT Championship next week, so... Hopefully that includes some TNA people, not just Raw and SmackDown wrestlers. That would be cool. But, um, yeah, I'm excited to see what they do with it. I thought Perez and Jordan had the best match at Battleground. Wasn't a fan of the tainted finish, but you kind of had to do that because you're not going to beat Jordan clean, this other champions, this other company's champion clean. That kind of would have been selfish by WWE to do that. I mean, Perez still won, but it wasn't like a clean win. She, she won off of that distraction from Tatum Paxley and Ash by Elegance at ringside. It also sets up Jordan and Nash at some point, which they were already building to in TNA, as well as uh, Jordan versus Tatum Paxley, probably as soon as uh, Friday's Against All Odds event. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. And uh, I think that'll be a good match, Tatum Paxley and Jordan Grace on Friday. Hopefully we do get more to the TNA NXT partnership. And, um, you know, we get more matches, more moments, stuff like that, because I think it's cool. I think it benefits both brands equally. Probably more so... I don't know, actually. I think it's actually mutually mutually beneficial. I don't think TNA's ratings are going to go up, but they get more exposure. And NXT benefits because they're putting their people over the NXT talent and they're getting more people to work with, probably grooming a person like a Jordan to be in WWE eventually. So I think it's a win-win, honestly. Uh, at least for now. At Tom Van Dam, 769-505, their question was, we've been getting biopics lately for everyone, seemingly... Uh, if you had the time, what wrestler would you personally like to create a biopic for? And who would you cast in the lead? I've seen other people say this. Uh, this is the only, like, I'm not creative enough to think of like, oh, this person would be perfect. This would be cool though. I cor- I saw Chris Van Vliet. He didn't say what I'm about to say, but he had mentioned to Chavo, oh, what if they did a movie on the Guerrero family, or Eddie Guerrero? I agree with that. But what someone said, it might have been at Suplex on Twitter, I forget. But someone said, do a biopic, a biopic, whatever the fuck you call it, on Eddie Guerrero, which is cool, like Iron Claw style. This is why Chris Van Vliet asked Chavo that. Do a biopic on Eddie Guerrero and have, because obviously he's, you know, 
Latino or whatever. He's, he's Spanish or whatever. Um, God, what's his name? Uh, Mandalorian guy. Wonder Woman 1984. Narcos. Um, holy shit. What's the what's his fucking name? I'm blanking now. What what is this goddamn? I'm gonna have to look it up while we're on here. Mandalorian actor. Um, holy shit. Pedro Pascal. How did I forget Pedro Pascal? It's because we're I'm recording here and I shit's off the top of my head and I forget. You know, Pedro Pascal is like an Eddie Guerrero type person. As an Eddie Guerrero, uh, him as Eddie Guerrero in that role would be fucking cool, I think. I think Pedro's a great actor. I think he would be a good fit for that role. I think Pedro's older now, but Eddie was also like, what, 50 when he died? 45 maybe? No, actually, wasn't he 35? Eddie was young. He was, Eddie was really young, I'm pretty sure. Let's see, Eddie Guerrero. Eddie, oh, my fucking computer's botching on me now. Pretty sure Eddie was like really, really young when he died. Not like 20, but, you know. Um, he was b- 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 38 years old. So, Pedro, I think is 50, I'm pretty sure. So, mm, I don't know. I think you can get away with it, though. I think you can get away with it. But, yeah, that's probably what I would do. An Eddie biopic, biopic, whatever, with uh, Pedro in the lead. That, that would be my choice. And that's going to do it, guys, for today's Hashtag Ask GSM episode 550. Thank you guys for making this another successful edition, another fun edition to answer your questions. Uh, we'll be back next week with another all-new episode. If you want to send in questions, you can do so, as always, by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRam with the hashtag Ask GSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash gram.gsm.matthews. Drop the comment I usually put up on Tuesday nights. Um, over on the Facebook page or on the wall itself. And last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section on this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. Have an awesome one, guys. Have an awesome rest of your week. I'm Graham Jason Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.